All right. Welcome to the Get Your Energy Back podcast. Today, I have a very special guest with me. This is a friend of mine. I have known her. How long have we known each other for? Probably 17 years. Time, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would venture to say that you are one of my very like longest friendships I've ever had in my life. So this is my dear friend and fellow coach, Lorraine Wagaman. And I'm going to let her tell you about her story, how she came to coaching and how it's helped her today. And hopefully that will help you find some something in her story that resonates with you too. So you can see the transformational power that happens with coaching. So Lorraine, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Tell us a little <laughs> bit about you. All right. Well, um, I uh, was a military wife like Shelby. And so we met here in Ohio and now yeah, we're both back. But um I'm mom of six kids and I'm not a very, I've got a degree in math and all kinds of fun things, but, um, my story. So hang on. She's being a little modest. This girl was a rocket scientist. (laughs) Okay, guys. Like, (laughs) you know, (laughs) and one of the things that I remember when we first met, one of the things that we used to do together all the time was she taught me how to use Photoshop and how to use Photoshop, Photoshop elements and how to do digital scrapbooking. And we would spend hours on our laptops. Like, And I still do spend hours doing digital scrapbooking. Yes. <laughs> in my creative outlet. So um, Shelby told me she was becoming a life coach and I didn't really know what that meant. But in, I don't know, when was that? 2020? She's she just, she gave a free class on setting up your goals for the next year. And I signed up for your class, Shelby, only because I love you. <laughs> you probably reason. know that. <laughs> yeah. But it turned out it was the best thing that I ever did for myself because it changed my life. Um, I think one of the things I was talking to a friend just last night about life coaching is that parents go, people go to great ends to help their kids, but they don't even know that they need help. Mm -hmm. And they're just so busy in their life getting through and they don't know that there's so many things out there that could change their lives. And that for me, that's what life coaching did. It changed my life for the better. Um, Yeah. So tell us a little bit about like at the beginning when you first were having, you know, first classes with Mm -hmm. life coaching principles, like where were you at in your life, like emotionally? Well, emotionally, I was probably in a lot, a lot worse off than I even realized. <laughs> I know. Same. Um, <laughs> it was in, I mean, it was COVID. So we already, yeah. we already know that. But also I was dealing with some diagnoses with family members and our, my husband had just come back a few months before from being on with the military for three years and so we were having a terrible time reintegrating yes him into our family um when he left all of our children were little and he came home to a house with a bunch of teenagers which was like you can imagine (laughs) and um I was just struggling I had lost my sense of self because I had been taking care of everybody else for so long Mm -hmm. that um yeah Lorraine was at the very bottom of the list and so I set my goal to spend the next year learning to love myself and it was so amazing and so transforming for me to and what I learned from that is that taking care of yourself and loving yourself is one of the very least selfish things that you can ever do for your for your family because when you love yourself and take care of yourself then you can take care of them so much better yeah I this is a really important piece I think and like something that's very interesting why do you think that we as women so often get caught in that trap of thinking I've got to take care of everybody else and putting ourselves last on the list. Like what's your thoughts about that? Cause I find it so frequently when I coach. Um, I don't know. I think it's social um, thing that we're taught. Um, and we, well, we all have really great moms who did that. Mm-hmm. 
and maybe that's part of it. And so we've been watched them and the only, that's the only, only way we know how to be. Yeah. And, um, you know, we're taught over and over again that we shouldn't be selfish, that we shouldn't, you know, all of these things. And I don't know that anybody ever tells us, I don't think anyone ever tells us that taking care of ourselves is selfish, but Mm -hmm. somehow we, I don't know, maybe we think we're great because we put ourselves at the bottom of the list. I know it's so fascinating. I think too, so much what you've said, it is so unintentional. Mm-hmm. We don't recognize that we're doing right, I don't it. I think we know we're doing it. Exactly. Exactly. Until it's brought to our attention. So you did something that was so cool that I like share with people. I'm like, she created her own program. Like, <laughs> So do you want to tell us a little bit of what you did in that whole year when you were, cause you went all in on deciding, okay, I'm going to find I, myself. I did go all in and I just, I started brainstorming and it just kind of poured in. And so I approached learning to love myself like a dating relationship, like I was courting myself. And so I thought about the different things that we do when we're courting, for example, making our bodies beautiful for that person. And so I had had four areas or yeah, four areas, making, making yourself beautiful, getting to know yourself having fun and serving yourself. And then a fifth one that I added later was my, your relationship with God, because I realized that that was an important component. And so one of the first things that I did in um, making yourself beautiful is I went and had a sleep study done that I had known for 15 years I needed to have done and fixing my sleep made a huge difference, for example. So It's not all about getting a makeover, whatever. (laughs) Yeah. And that made such a drastic difference in your life too. Yeah, it really did. You know, and just getting, getting better sleep, um, blesses my family. I also don't wait up for my teenagers anymore. I just go to bed. They can wake me up if they really need me. (laughs) Well, I think that that was something that, again, like I coached with you, but I coach with a lot of Mm -hmm. moms that we have this perfect mom mold in our mm-hmm. mind. And she's on 24 seven at everybody's beck and call at any moment. Like she never gets any time any, off, <laughs> never gets any time off. She's ready to drop everything at, a, at the drop of a hat and go be there for her kids and learning that, wait, it's actually not bad. If I don't do that every single time, mm-hmm. like, I remember just like the different expectations of like, how we feed our kids, like how we, like how breakfast looks, just different (laughs) little things that were like, no, but like a perfect mom, Mm -hmm. the mom that I'm supposed to be would do these things. And we have this image of perfect mom and we judge ourselves because she does we can't live up to her. And somehow at the same time, we think everybody else does. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. I think there's something so powerful about healing and community, understanding that there's no woman out there that does all of those things. We see little pieces that people do. We don't know all of the things that they let go in order to be able to do those little pieces really well. Like, I think that well, I was just on a coaching call yesterday with a friend and she was saying, oh, I just feel bad because my husband gets the kids out of the door like in the morning. And I'm like, and she's like, nobody else does all the other moms get up and they get their kids out of like, um, I don't. And then another girl was like, neither do I like most days, my husband wakes up and he takes care of the kids. She was Two doing of so my much children guilt. Needs before I, and I don't even talk to them. <laughs> yeah. But, and it did take, even me, I'm like, I felt a lot of guilt about that. I'm like, well, I should have enough energy to be able to get up. And I mean, these three of the three, four, three of the four of my kids are out the door before 7.00 AM. Like, <laughs> like I should have the energy to do that, but mm-hmm. my husband's just as happy to do it. Or there's lots of other um, creative ways to get those needs met. That doesn't mean that we're doing a bad job. Exactly. That's just degrading the relationship with ourself. Mm-hmm. So tell us more about your, your experience during this year. Well, I, one of the biggest things that happened for me as I started coaching was that I started learning to notice my thought patterns. And our brains are so 
so funny. Like our brains will make a, a pattern out of anything. Our brains like habits. So like I noticed the other day that my parents live like, like a mile and a half from me and I always drive to their house the mm -hmm. same way. Like, right. My brain likes that way. You go this way, you turn, you turn again. And I was riding with my husband. My husband was driving and he went a different way. And my brain was like, what? Can't drive to my parents' house that way, right? <laughs> he might do it that way every time. I don't know. But his way, that way is just as, as great. And it's probably, I mean, basically the same distance. But my brain has figured out a way it likes to do it. And so mm -hmm. it does it. And our brains do that with thoughts too. Just like one little thought and our brain has a script and it will take us through the whole script without uh, just the same way I can drive to my parents' house and not even think about the path that I'm taking. And so when we first, when you first, I think when we first learn about coaching, we start making, noticing these things and then we start getting up, shaming ourselves for them. Yeah. But I really think that, that noticing them is an amazing thing because once you notice and accept that it's happening, then you have the power to do something about it. And so one of my best thought scripts um, I like to call it a rabbit hole thought. Yes. <laughs> and my, the, I think the place I do this the most is in the shower. It's like my brain is like, this is the perfect time to, you know, you, you have a script for how to take a shower. So let me tell you these things. And so I could, would start one thought, um, about it's probably something my husband said or did because those are the best ones always and pretty soon by the you know within a by the time I'd finished washing my hair I was in full-on self-loathing I was the most horrible person I never did anything right right and I'd gone thought 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 my brain knew the script I didn't have to it didn't even need me to participate right mm -hmm. and something beautiful happened the day that I was like oh and I noticed it was happening and the next time it started and I said out loud I think I'd like to talk to my brain I'm not gonna do this today and it stopped and I'm not sure that my brain ever offered me that thought ever again like it only took that one time for me to say, I'm not playing, I don't want to do this game anymore. It doesn't help me. And my brain was like, oh, okay, we'll do something else. And it's so beautiful mm -hmm. because I had probably been down that path hundreds or thousands of times. And all I had to do was notice it a few times and it was gone. Oh. That is such a powerful <laughs> story because I think sometimes we're like, oh, if I want to change things, it's going to take a really long mm -hmm. time. And probably you heard like in a coaching a lot of times, it's not like that was the right. first time, but it was the first time recognizing I'm somebody having this rabbit hole thought that I know where it leads. It's not helpful. And I don't have to participate. I actually have a choice. I have agency exactly. right here. And that is the beautiful thing is that when you notice your thoughts, you have the power. Oof. <laughs> yes. So, so a lot of my <laughs> listeners obviously struggle with chronic fatigue and low energy. How did understanding your emotional states and starting to learn how to love yourself, how did that improve your energy? Oh, it was like a complete 180 degree turn because when I let my thoughts just go and lead me to these places of self-loathing and whatever, that was like pretty much a guarantee for no more energy. It was a sit in the couch and watch Netflix and do nothing the rest of the day and um, just allowing first allowing those thoughts to be but also choosing just 
it's just a different energy happiness happiness brings a different energy than self-loathing that's just what it is and we can we can do so many things when we feel good about ourselves that we could never do any other time yeah and i don't know about you but for me because that i would hit the same exact pattern and be like Mm -hmm. i don't know why i feel so terrible oh i've just been like very cruel to myself. It kind of makes sense. Like we we d- dysregulate ourselves mm-hmm. with these thought patterns that are just unintentional. We're not doing it on purpose. Like no, nope, we're not doing it to. Like I said, we're not doing it on purpose. And yet we but say the- things to ourselves we would never say to yes. anybody. Else. Yes. So, but I I don't know about you, but for me, part of that was learning that after I've said those things to myself and I have that really drained energy where I'm in that collapse state, especially because I've just like freaked myself out so much. The first piece of healing had to do with being okay with being there, mm-hmm. like not judging that I was there. That's where I like opened up the space to start to access yes. the healing because then you just add insult to injury because then you're mad at yourself for being there. So now you have a new thing to criticize of yourself for. Like, see, and you're not even doing anything. You like, spiral oh. a little more. Yes. yes. So if you're finding yourself where you're like, yep, I don't have any energy. I'm finding myself on the couch, watching Netflix, binging, whatever, just, you know, overeating, whatever the thing is that we do to numb because we're, we're so afraid of how we're feeling that shame. So if you are finding yourself doing that in my invitation to you, and, and you can say what has helped you too, Lorraine, my invitation is to start to make peace with where you're at without judging where you're at and starting to build from where you are and letting go of that expectation of the perfect mom that you think that you should be. Yeah. In fact, I remember one day being so down and actually saying to myself, I mean, the only way you know how to deal with this right now is food. Mm -hmm. So go eat and we'll figure out what you can do differently next time. But for today, you're not that girl. And then when you're, I was in a different position, I was able to think about, and, and the next time I was able to do different. Same thing with, it's okay, girl. Watch a show today. Watch the whole season. Watch the, <laughs> if that's what you need. Yeah. I, I, this is why I'm an unconventional coach. I feel like, cause I'm like, <laughs> yes, go do those things. <laughs> Because what it's doing is creating safety with where you're at. And once you feel safe, then you can create a new pattern. But being dysregulated and staying in that level of dysregulation without soothing yourself is just a recipe for continued Mm -hmm. just disaster. Yeah. I told someone not that long ago, if you could hate yourself into being better, I'd be all for it. But it doesn't work that way. (laughs) No, I know. Isn't that such a bummer? So, um, yeah. So tell us a little bit more about your journey becoming a coach. Cause this is, this has been a fun adventure for you. It has been a fun adventure. It's not something I ever thought I would do. Um, Facebook decided I should be a coach before I did. It started telling me this, but um, it really was for me an answer to prayer. Um, I found myself it was on my mind, but I hadn't really considered it. Then I somehow found myself praying about that and just got a real strong, overwhelming feeling that this was something that I should do. And so off I went. (laughs) And so, yeah, it's been a fun, fun journey. And even becoming a coach, I've learned so many things that have helped me and blessed my family. Yeah. And I guess I should circle back around. How did it go by the end of the year with your goal of learning to love yourself? Well, by the end of the year, um, I stopped tracking my goal about 10 months in. So I guess about 10 months in, I must have decided that I had reached my goal. <laughs> so, Well, you were tracking it. You had, she, guys, <laughs> it was amazing. She had like a bullet journal with like all of the things, like this is exactly how you do it. Like step-by-step, step. she really put so much mind power and effort into it. And you'd be like, okay, I've checked this thing. I did this mm-hmm. thing. I did this thing. Like you treated it almost like it was a part-time job. 
I did. It was a big deal. And I now have this big, beautiful journal that ends in October. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And so tell us about like the girl that took the first class that was like, wait a second, I've got some thoughts and these are creating terrible emotions in me Mm -hmm. to this girl who now has the self-compassion and love for her. Like, tell us a little bit about that difference between these two versions of you. Well, that girl, she really, she was just trying to get through. Yeah. She didn't even know how bad it was. She just knew that she didn't have another choice. And so she was doing it and she didn't have a lot of joy in life. I don't, I don't think, I don't think I realized that at the time, but I really was just getting through. And today I, what's different. I have an amazing morning routine. Yes, she does. It's me for my whole day. I am building my relationship with my husband and children. I have three friends that I schedule time with every single week. Um, and I'm lucky to be one of them. <laughs> and I don't feel guilty doing that because I now realize just how much those my girl time, my friend time means to me. Mm-hmm. So, and how much it fuels me. So those are some of the big differences. I don't, I don't really very often feel guilty. Maybe that's a big difference. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> like a drop the mic moment (laughs) so because not that I don't do anything wrong but I I'm a lot better at embracing that it's just part of me yeah I think so many people need to hear that because guilt is one of the emotions that a lot of women struggle with especially as moms so Lorraine's got the answer if you want to stop (laughs) feeling guilty she solved the issue so maybe that's a bad thing though maybe that means I just I'm doing terrible things and I'm just unaware I I don't think that that is anywhere near the truth, knowing you in real life. So um, yeah. So if you want to let us know, how can we find out more about you? If people are interested in hearing about your coaching um, or is there anything, I think that you have an ebook out. Can you tell us a little bit about that? So you can find me on Facebook, Lorraine Wagaman Life Coaching. And um, in the next week, I'm hoping to put out there my, I'm going to have a free ebook. It's notice your thoughts, transform your lives. And it contains three types of destructive thoughts that you can let go of today. Yeah. So good. Okay. All of those things will be in the show note links. So you can check her out on Facebook and go download her ebook because it's so beautiful. (laughs) So good. Well, it's so wonderful to see you, Lorraine. Is there any last parting things you'd like to tell before we head off? I would just encourage everyone to go on their own journey of self-love. Oh, I love it so much. Thank you so much for being here, Lorraine. This was amazing. You're welcome. We'll talk to you later. All right. Bye-bye. Bye.